everyone. Uh, welcome back to our lecture series uh, on the political history of modern Japan. Um, this is going to be the last uh, planned talk in this series, and today I'm going to look at uh, the issue of social inequality uh, in Japan. And I'm going to um, also kind of place this issue in the broader context of a global inequality, because it's very important, I think, to see these things as very much intertwined. Uh, Japan is, of course, a part of the global economy. It's uh, the third largest uh, economy in the world and very much involved in global affairs. And if, as we've seen in previous lectures, in terms of the economy, for instance, in uh, as I've discussed with uh, neoliberal reforms undertaken in Japan. Um, you know, these things very much have uh, effects uh, for, um, for, for the domestic situation in Japan. And, <clears throat> you know, many of these actions taken at uh, uh, the kind of global uh, level uh, can can really go a long way toward exacerbating or perhaps uh, the other way relieving uh, inequality. But in any case, um, this is the the direction I want to go in uh, today. And um, you know, probably you know, maybe a few decades ago, we some people may have had the the image of uh, Japan as you know, a relatively um, kind of equal society. Uh, and within Japan, conservative leaders tried to promote the idea for many decades, um, even long after uh, this idea no, no longer matched reality, that Japan was, um, that everyone in Japan was kind of middle class. Uh, it was so chudu kaiku, right? Um, well, <clears throat> this idea has pretty much gone out the window now. Um, and it, it just doesn't hold water anymore. Um, and, you know, after that, probably around the, the early 90s, especially, there was a lot of focus on Japan instead as an unequal society, as a uh, kakusa shakai. And this was, you know, picked up quite widely in, in the media and was talked about and the, the sources and causes of inequality in Japan. And since then, a lot of research has been published on the issue. There's a lot of great books that, in fact, uh, I would have really loved to have gotten into in, in more detail in this talk, which um, unfortunately I'm, I'm not going to be able to and just um, won't have time to do. But um, <clears throat> in any case, I am going to highlight some examples just briefly. Uh, that that present one uh, perspective on this issue of uh, social inequality in Japan. And I'm not so much going to be looking at uh, the, the kind of effects on a micro level, so how they really impact um, individual people. Um, but I, I will start kind of from a more macro level, um, looking at things that also especially... Uh, large trends in global context, the next bringing it down to, um, to the situation in Japan, and then beyond that, looking at um, how some of these changes and how inequality has affected um, an example of one group in Japan. But um, there, there are many other, you know, how, how these things affect people's daily lives. Uh, it's very important to uncover um, and Unfortunately, I won't have so much time to go into detail on that in, in this talk, um, but uh, perhaps hopefully for, uh, you know, a topic for, for a future talk. Okay. <clears throat> so, I've titled uh, my talk Social Inequality and in Japan and Globally. And... I want to start out um, just by giving a very short overview of 
I don't know, just some of the some of the general facts, some some things that that are kind of might have been very eye catching uh, in in rather recent headlines uh, that we may have noticed in regards to global inequality, and especially here I'm drawing from a very nice summary on uh, inequality.org, and then they also draw from information from the World Inequality Report and Oxfam, uh, etc. But they all document that global inequality is, has been growing for the past several decades. And for instance, the world's richest 1%, people who uh, have over $1 million in uh, wealth, capture more than, uh, capture 44% of global wealth. Whereas, on the other hand, adults uh, who only have less than uh, $10,000 and this is 56.6 of the world population, they only have, that only amounts to less than 2% of uh, global wealth. So there's this huge disparity then between uh, the richest 1% and um, the bottom, the entire bottom half of world population. And so, so this is, you know, one of the, the main kind of um, statistics or, or pieces of data that is presented when um, when global inequality is covered uh, in, in the media, etc. And also, you know, related to that, 0.002% um, of the richest individuals, a, a fraction of individuals, hold an astounding 7.2% of global wealth. The 10 richest billionaires own over $801 billion dollars, uh, in combined national wealth, uh, combined wealth, this is more than most nations' GDPs. And so then, this wealth gap between the richest and the poorest uh, is is growing and has been growing for many decades. And this is true, you know, all over in in most different countries, in most countries, in uh, Russia, even in China, in the U.S. especially, and in European nations. Um, they're all becoming more unequal. Uh, especially since, as I've documented in and uh, talked about in another lecture, uh, neoliber neoliberal reforms uh, from the 1980s and 90s. And in the United States, which is a particularly unequal so society, um, and, you know, from among other advanced uh, industrial nations, the top 1% there holds 425 of all national wealth, which you know, is, is an amazing uh, figure. And I would also like to point out that successive shocks to the capitalist system from financial crises, climate change, and as we're experiencing now, especially COVID, are exacerbating inequality and the upward uh, transfer of wealth. And this is similar to what Naomi Klein described uh, already, you know, more than a decade ago, I think, um, as the, the, her idea of the shock doctrine. So I'm gonna point out some graphs here. Uh, I hope I'm not gonna run into any copyright issues because I did not make these, so I'm gonna try to sort, uh, you know, cite my sources as well as possible. But this is from uh, that uh, inequality.org, and then they're drawing their uh, data from the World Inequality Report. But as you can see, this, each color represents a different nation, um, and then we have, you know, since the time since the 1980s to 2015 down on the bottom here. And this is the share of national income going to the top decile right here. So how much of national income does the top decile own? And in, in countries that were already relatively, or areas that were already relatively um, had kind of Big, large wealth gaps, um, you know, maybe not so much of a change, but in other places, um, and this I think points out the shift from kind of the Keynesian welfare state embedded liberalism to more neoliberal structural reforms. Again, um, we see just dramatically rising um, levels of national wealth going to the top decile in the U.S. and Canada just steadily rising. In India, rising quite a lot. Um, in Europe, 
right here, so gradually rising, but rising nonetheless. And Russia, of course, is just astounding after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. Levels of equality there skyrocket, um, and, you know, propelling it to, to uh, levels of inequality that, that exceed many places, you know, in certainly in, in Europe, for instance. Um, and China as well, you know, since Deng Xiaoping's market reforms, I mean, and, and perhaps even from, um, you know, the, the um, framework for this was set in place, you know, perhaps even earlier, maybe even from the beginning, levels of inequality there are rising as well. China is a major player in the global capitalist market, one of the top capitalist nations in the world. Um, so, of course, it's going to have very high levels of inequality. Um, and then here, again, this is the uh, global, the share of global income going to the top 1% versus the bottom uh, 50%. As I stated earlier, they have the majority of uh, wealth here, top 1%, um, and the bottom 50, you know, having... Uh, very little. Oops, That's strange. Weird. Uh, okay. Well, I just won't have that full screen then. But I wanted to point out, um, you know, then how how things have maybe progressed um, during COVID, and as I'm sure we've all seen in the news uh, titles, such as this, for instance. Can I make a big screen now? No, I can't. Weird. All right. Whatever. Um, here's here's just um, one news source that, that I pulled up on a quick Google search. But I mean, they're all over. Look in The Guardian, BBC, anywhere. You'll find similar things. Um, from USA Today, not, not a newspaper that I typically read, but, you know, um, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, among U.S. billionaires, getting richer during coronavirus pandemic. So... Everybody else, by the way, is getting poorer. <laughs> um, people are losing their jobs, um, have no job stability, are, you know, getting, are literally kicked out of house and home, can't pay their rent, all of these horrible things going on uh, all over. If you're lucky enough to be in, you know, a place where um, uh, the government might give you some kind of, like, uh, stimulus checks or continue to give you a salary uh, or, or some kind of something else, which basically equates to some kind of basic income. Um, that's great. It, people in the U S don't have that. People in Japan don't have that, but nonetheless, you know, wealth just doesn't, um, it doesn't just disappear. It's just, it gets transferred around. It gets moved around. Right. Um, so, you know, where, where's all that wealth going? Well, um, one possible answer to that uh, would be that it's just going up and it's getting more and more concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer individuals like these billionaires here. here here's the caption down here. Since President Trump declared a national emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic, 614 U.S. billionaires grew their net worth $931 billion, which is astounding. <clears throat> All right. Let's go back into full screen, uh, which works now for some reason. Um, all right, so why is, why is this global inequality growing in this way? I mean, I think probably many of the reasons for this should already be clear, as have been elaborated on in earlier lectures, I hope. Um, but I want to I wanna position this in the context of some research that came out in, I think, around 2014. And attracted a lot of attention, and that's the work by uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, Capital in the 21st Century. And the biggest reason why Piketty's work, I think, was, was I picked up and cited so much is that it provided this kind of underlying framework and the data to, to back up um, objectively uh, the, the idea that global inequality is indeed uh, growing. And Piketty's you know, um, kind of mo most famous point, I guess, was this U curve, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But I also want to note that he posited um, global inequality as a function of uh, alpha equals uh, the rate of return on capital times uh, 
uh, beta, and I'll, I'll talk about what those mean in a minute as well. I had a question mark there because I want to just note that this is one theory of uh, global inequality. I, I don't think it explains it entirely, but I, I want um, the reason why I'm uh, um, pointing out Piketty here anyway uh, is because so many researchers then built on his work uh, in to to advance their arguments of inequality, including uh, one of the articles that we read for this class by Inoue Shin. So uh, Piketty says that when the rate of return on capital exceeds the rate of growth of output and income, as it did in the 19th century and seems quite likely to do again in the 21st, capitalism automatically generates arbitrary and unsustainable inequalities that radically undermine the meritocratic values on which democratic societies are based. This is page one, by the way. So, I mean, Capital in the 21st Century, it's a long book. And I'll be honest, I, I had a hard time getting through it. Um, it's like eight or 900 pages. Um, but one of the things that helps is that Piggy is a very straightforward, you know, writer. He's, he's a good writer. I, I like his writing style. Um, it's very straightforward. And he just, he lays it out right here on page one, um, which is great, which is nice, I think. Um, and so basically inequality is increasing everywhere. This is, this is what he says. And this is why, again, his research was so cited. And he's, he points out this U curve of inequality from around the world. This is what his data uh, that he and his team collected shows from the Belle Epoque to post 2008. Uh, so that in the U S for instance, as I mentioned, the top decile share of wealth, um, was uh, between 45 and 50 percent in the 1910s and 20s, very unequal. The top decile held about you know half of national wealth. This dropped to less than 35 percent immediately after World War II in the 1950s. So this would be the most equal period then in modern U.S. history, probably in U.S. history uh, in general. But then after that, once again, the top decile share of national wealth goes up to about half again to where we are now. So they're back to these bellipoke kind of uh, levels, right? And that's the U curve, essentially. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, but here it is explained. It's not too hard to figure out. Um, one thing that is interesting is that Piketty, you know, looks at, at inequalities of function of national wealth. And this as well, I think, is, is an often um, a lot of other researchers kind of picked up on this, you know, as she included. Um, and... And, and this has been, you know, very, I guess, a, a kind of um, convincing and convenient way for people to uh, try to qualify and quantify uh, inequality within a particular nation, but also comparatively. In the global average, um, capital's percent of national income is about 600 percent, or six to seven years of national income. Uh, I mean, this was in 1870, right? It was about six, seven years. In 1950, and the 1950s, it dropped down to about two to three years, so 200 to 300% of national income. And now it's about four to five years of national income. So again, U-curve here, just kind of um, categorized in a different way. And as I mentioned, he looks at inequality as a function of R, the rate of return on capital, uh, over growth, the rate of growth. So when the rate of growth, uh, when the rate of return on capital significantly exceeds the growth rate of the economy, then it logically follows that inherited wealth grows faster than output and income. And this is really important. So basically what's happening here is he's, he's talking about our post-growth society. We, we don't live, you know, we live in a, in a society of declining uh, growth rates, demographically, but also in terms of, um, you know, productive capitalism, I guess, like how much growth does it generate? Um, so if growth is seen as a good thing here, as a desirable thing, um, then according to Piketty, this would create a more growth, would, would create lower levels of inequality, less growth would, create, would create more. Why? Because basically, um, if, if there's less growth, there's less to go around, I guess. And then the capital that has already been created that does exist, that people have their capital and assets that they hold become, becomes exponentially more important. So the haves 
you know, what they have becomes more important and there's less for other people um, to, to go around, basically, is, is the idea. <clears throat> and he says, the importance of capital in the wealthy countries today is primarily due to a slowing of both demographic growth and productivity growth, coupled with political regimes that objectively favor private capital. Well, this is important. I mean, I, he doesn't go into so much detail on this, actually, but this is key. Uh, lots of other authors look more at this kind of um, political economy aspect of things. And then he also talks about how he measures capital, how you can measure capital. Like, how does, how does he figure out, like, how much capital um, is, uh, there is in comparison to, to national wealth, right? I mean, that, that's a big part of his argument. So um, basically, he divides the stock of capital by the annual flow of income. Uh, and this is the capital income ratio, which then he writes as beta. Uh, so that if a country's total capital stock is six years of national income, then beta would be six, or beta equals 600%, something like that. So then he says this leads to the first law of capitalism. Well, all right. I mean, when I first read this, I thought this sounded really convincing, like, ooh, a law of capitalism. Wow, it's figured something out. But I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't really know. I mean, I don't, I think... He could probably look, you could, you could argue that um, if you're looking at the historical progression of capitalism, um, like, you know, whether or not this is a law, um, I, I think is a bit, um, you know, you could, you could argue against that point. But in any case, um, this is alpha equals uh, uh, R times beta. And alpha is the share of income from capital in national income. R is the rate of return on capital. So if beta is 600%, um, and it's the capital income ratio, and the rate of return on capital is 5%, then the share of income from capital uh, would be R times beta equals 30%. The share of capital in national, meaning the share of capital in national income is 30%, and the share of labor, uh, the share uh, that, that labor holds of national income is 70%, right? So he's comparing this again is dividing national income into the share held by the shares held by capital and the shares held by labor. This is also important to uh, note. And here is Piketty's data um, for the U.S. showing income equality: the share of the top, uh, the share that the top decile holds of national income, national wealth. And again, right around those decades that I described on an earlier slide, they're up to about half, and then it drops down dramatically after World War II. <clears throat> and for much of the post-war until about the 1980s has, is, you know, below, is, is like below 35%. Um, so, so pretty equal here. And then it just rises dramatically again to where now those who have a lot, they have a lot of money and an extremely high amount of money and those, and, and only their portion is growing. This is from John Cassidy, Piketty's Inequality Story in Six Charts from the New Yorker. Uh, it's not my data, I just uh, took this chart from there. Um, and Piketty says that global growth uh, is slowing down, has been slowing down, and will likely be slower in the future, which, you know, okay, great, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm all right with that, actually. But, <clears throat> but again, Piketty, he, he's got a fairly positive view of growth. Um, but according to the law of cumulative growth, this shows that low annual growth over a long period actually leads to big changes. So this is pretty important. And he says, an apparently, an apparently small uh, gap between the return on capital and the rate of growth can in the long run have powerful destabilizing effects on the structure of dynamics and social inequality. Yes, of course. Can think about feudalism when peasants had basically nothing. And since no new technology was producing any kind of, uh, or no, no, the social relations of the time were not focused on producing growth. Um, society as a general, in general, wasn't focused on producing growth. Just a few handful of, of rich aristocrats held everything. They held all the capital, all the assets. So even if growth is like basically zero, their their wealth still increases because they're the only ones with assets, right? <clears throat> so it's that's basically what you can how you can think about what Piggy's saying in, in terms of a long historical um, period. <clears throat>
and he says demographic growth over history has followed a large bell curve. Low for most of history, boom above 1% between 1950 and 2012, now returning to 0% by the end of the 21st century. So again, this is his inverse U curve, but he says now it's a bell curve, right? Because if there's a boom in growth, if there's a boom in demographic population, the, the baby boomer generation in, in the U.S. and Japan, um, that, that this is going to actually then levels of inequality will drop at that time. This is what he's arguing. <clears throat> and he says strong demographic growth tends to play an equalizing role because it decreases the importance of inherited wealth. Okay, so yeah, that seems fairly convincing, especially if you consider inherited wealth, right? Conversely, a stagnant or worse decreasing population increases the influence of capital accumulated in previous generations. Again, what I described with uh, an aristocratic aristocrats and feudalism, something like that. Um, the rentier class, right? There is no historical example of a country at the world technological frontier whose growth in per capita output exceeded 1.5% over a lengthy period of time. So again, also, I think this is important to note as well, that long historical trends um, show that most of history has been, you know, had growth rates around like zero because Society wasn't focused on producing, on mass producing things, on, on growing um, in general. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but we have this idea, I think, now living in um, the 20th, 21st century um, that, well, growth rates, they, just, they, they keep going up. The GDP keeps going up. This is a great thing. Um, but, but if you look at most of history, that, that's completely not what has happened. It is important to bear this reality in mind because many people think that growth ought to be at least 3 or 4% per year. As noted, both history and logic show this to be illusory. And again, as I've mentioned, Piketty generally has a positive view of growth. I'll mention again in a later slide why, this, why some people might be able to argue against this. Um, and he looks at the metamorphosis of capital in the UK and France and documents these changes, basically, of, of his U-curve. Um, he also looks at the at growth rates and savings rates, um, because if there's a very low growth rate and a high savings rate, then he also, this is how he calculates the return on cal capital. Um, so growth rates are low, saving rates are high, there's gonna be a high return on capital. If there's a high return on capital and low growth rates, then there's going to be high levels of inequality, is how his argument goes. And this is interesting. I, I put this data, data in here just because we are talking about Japan. And if you look at the growth rate um, as a percent of national income, we have you know kind of similar levels here. But then if you look at the growth rate population, Japan is very low, Britain is very low. Um, and, and then if you look at private savings, Japan is very high, it has nearly double the amount of um, the percent of private savings as national percent of national income um, compared to the US or in Britain. And if you investigate this private savings further, um, here's private savings again, the same one. And then if you look at household, how much of that comes from household net savings, and then how much is corporate net savings or net retained earnings, which um, I mean, that's uh, profit, basically. Um, here you can see that Japan actually has um, a large, you know, high levels of private savings, of course, um, but assets here are not really that uh, big or great, so they're basically negligible. Um, but corporate net savings and retained earnings, they have very large assets, so savings on these uh, are going to be quite important. And I think the interesting thing to note here is that Japan, again, in this regard, um, is more than double the United States and almost double uh, the UK. So why the rise in capital inequality? Well, much of this should already be apparent from what I've explained in Piketty's argument. One, slow growth and high savings, as I just talked about. Two, the privatization of public wealth and assets, which he doesn't go into so much detail about, but he does mention, for instance, public wealth decreases one year um, uh, to one year of national income between 1970 and 2010, while private wealth 
uh, has risen to seven years of national income, or 700%, seven times national income during this time. And then governments, by the way, borrow to pay deficits um, by printing, I don't know, government bonds, for instance, within private companies, individuals, or corporations buy, which increase the national debt, but it also increases private wealth. Of course, the interest on government bonds is paid uh, from uh, taxes, people's taxes, so it, it generally that um, impoverishes uh, society more and uh, exacerbates uh, this decrease in public wealth and the rise in private wealth. And then the importance of the rise of asset prices, especially stock prices and higher real estate prices, um, and increased financialization of assets. I'm kind of actually um, um, ad uh, adapted kind of adapting Piketty's argument a little bit here and adding in kind of some other studies of the importance of financialization re recently. But, um, but Piketty does say that most wealth comes in the form of owned or inherited assets, particularly rent, which, quote, accounts for half of total national wealth. Wow. <clears throat> so this is similar to, I don't know, rentier capitalism as well. Um, if you have a lot of assets, if you have a lot of wealth, you're, you're going to be making more and more money off that because there's less of those things being created. Um, he looks at asset bubbles stemming from beta equals S over G as a result of an influx of capital. Um, so you get, you try, this is related to financialization as well. Um, this is then invested somewhere like foreign assets or real estate, um, which would be generally probably domestic assets. But this can cause trade friction and a rising real estate prices, of course, as we saw in um, the bubble in uh, Japan in the late 80s, both of which were observed in the uh, 1980s Japanese bubble. And the capital to income ratio is likely to rise in the future. Near, and Piketty says to near 700% by 2100, or approximately the level observed in Europe from the 18th century to the Belle Epoque. I would say that a point of critique and this is kind of, um, you know, tangential, but um, perhaps a point of critique that I'm still working on formulating of Piketty is his, with his overall historical approach is that he sees inequality as a function of uh, R over G rather than being rooted uh, in a particular set of social relations that determines control over access to the means of reproduction. In other words, he implicitly posits a return to growth or a sum of called productive capitalism as a remedy to inequality. So I think, you know, a, a critique could be made uh, here of Piggy. Other critiques from other positions as well could be made, but but rather than these critiques, what I, anyway, what I want to focus on is, um, you know, the power of Piggy's argument and his data that have been very influential, especially since his book came out, um, in terms of uh, quantifying and qualifying uh, levels of social social inequality both globally and around the world, and uh, in the case of Japan, as uh, we read about in this article by Inoue Shin, I titled this section "Neoliberalism and Abenomics." Um, Piketty's book isn't really, I mean, neoliberalism is kind of in the background, but if you've read studies of neoliberalism in general, they're very easy to kind of it's easy to make that. Um, kind of uh, synaptic connection in your brain between the two. Um, so this is where I pulled this title out here. But you know, Shin and also um, translator, but with a very int long introduction, Sachi and Mizohata, um, are, are especially focused on uh, the period that Prime Minister Abe was uh, in power in Japan and looking at social inequality, levels of social inequality during that time period. I mean, you know, longest uh, tenure of any Japanese prime minister. Uh, so, uh, uh, in, so this is, you know, uh, important, right? Um, that that Abe would have held this position for so long, and then to look at how things uh, progressed during this time. And the article that um, I'm drawing from here, you know, Ishin and Sachi and Mizuhata, inequality and precarity in Japan: the sorry achievements of Abenomics. Kind of says it all there in the title, I guess. Uh, the Asia Pacific Journal in Japan Focus, <clears throat> Volume 16, Issue 6, March 2008.
And they mention that inequality in this Kakusa Shakai uh, in Japan have been growing. The trickle-down trickle Abenomics, um, initially, of course, this word stemming from uh, Reaganomics and the idea of trickle-down economics. You make things easier for people at the top, make them a little richer, some of that money, sure, hey, it'll probably trickle down, right? That was that was the basic idea, and this is where Abe draws from this idea in Abenomics. It didn't help, and um, just as Reaganomics, obviously, it didn't help, but uh, the cabinet office claimed that Japan was in its longest post-war boom ever, and they pointed to a rise in nominal GDP. Um, of course, GDP is not a very good indicator of standards of living anyway. Um, in... 2014, the majority of Japanese found reported that they found living conditions, quote, difficult, and personal consumption has been on the decline. So it's hard to say that things are getting better for average people. And the Japanese poverty line keeps dropping, too, even when it has been growing for the U.S., Canada, France, Germany, and U.K. Of course, cuts to social welfare and public spending services and supports, um, they don't seem to be, that, that doesn't seem to be helping anybody. Um, well, meanwhile, corporate profits have been soaring. In 2012, they're 48.4 uh, 48 trillion uh, yen, I believe. In 2016, 75 trillion yen. While workers' earnings declined in the same period uh, in 2012 from 4.8 million yen to uh, 3.92 million yen in 2016. So actually average salaries and wages of workers in Japan have been on the decline since about 1996, 1997 when there is a peak. And the real wages are at their lowest levels, were, have been at their lowest levels during the time period that, that Abe was in power um, between 2013 and 2016. This is, it goes to 2016 because this is when they had data for this time. Obviously Abe uh, you know, just transitioned from power this year in 2020. But um, writing this article in 2018 and drawing from data until 2016. Um, accordingly, during that same time, the number of working poor rose dramatically and exceeded 11 million in 2016, but the retained earnings of corporations increased to record highs. So the increase of capital's portion of national income, and this is where it directly, where again, you know, as in their approach, um, kind of mirrors and draws from Piketty's approach, and decline, they, they map this increase in, of, of capital's proportion of national income and a decline of labor share of national income. And this aligns with the world data for OECD countries and many other countries around the world that labor share of income has been declining everywhere. Um, in Japan, a labor share of income uh, dropped from 46.5% in 1980 to 40.5% in 2015. But if you actually calculate this amount, I mean, okay, it seems like, well, yeah, 6%, right? But that's 200 trillion yen, and this is one of the largest uh, of all of the OECD countries. So the number of wealthy households has increased, but so has then the gap between large and small businesses and the wealth gap in Japanese society in general. And, you know, probably much like Obama did in the United States during his tenure. Um, Abe, <clears throat> but again, he'll say like, oh, look, um, but, you know, GDP and the stock market and um, unemployment levels, like, hey, these, these are good. These are good things, right? And so he, he would point out the number of employed people, but same again under Obama's tenure that most of these have just been precarious part-time workers. It's getting more and more people into just you know, part-time positions that pay next to nothing and that people can't really survive off of, so that now nearly 40% of the Japanese labor force is part-time. That's a huge amount. And the minimum uh, weight, and prior to, to 1984 deregula deregulation, it was just 15.3%. So again, you know, going back a few decades, we have this idea of shushin koyo, of lifetime employment in Japan, in Japanese company, like once you once you get a job there, once a worker gets a job there, they're set for life, they're taken care of, 
This is not the case anymore. Reality does not reflect this, and it has not for a while. That most people in Japan, or, or almost most, I guess, or almost half at least, are uh, in very precarious positions and are barely making enough to get by. The Japanese minimum wage is the lowest among 19 advanced economies, even though Japan is the third largest economy in the world. In 2006, part-time workers earned 35.3% less than full-time workers, and uh, this jumped, uh, let's see, yeah, uh, the amount in yen then jumped, the gap between part-time and full-time workers jumped from 10.9 to 11.32 uh, uh, million yen during the Abe cabinet. <clears throat> in addition, as we'll talk about uh, in later slides in more detail, most part-time workers are women. Six out of ten female workers are part-time workers in Japan. This is amazing. I mean, this is astounding, basically. So most of this pool of cheap part-time labor that's being used to boost the economy, to boost the stock market, to, to facilitate this upward transfer of wealth through the extraction of surplus value, this is coming from women, from Japanese women, who, as I will show in a, in a minute, bear a double burden as well, because uh, they also are doing the majority of housework. And there's a huge wage gap between men and women. So this directly contradicts Abe's idea of what he called womenomics, or I think he borrowed this term, but kind of stuck with him. And the World Economic Forum uh, Global Gender Gap Report ranked Japan 114th in 2014, so not very good. Uh, Kadoshi, death from overwork, jumped during this period too, so feeling the kind of social effects here. If anything, is trickling down because of these reforms of Abenomics. It's negative social effects like this. <clears throat> Abe claims that, claimed also that, that tax revenues uh, rose during his tenure, but, you know, there's different kinds of taxes, importantly, um, obviously not all good, um, you know, it's arguable whether, whether tax, you know, you know, you, you got to look at what, what kind of tax it is, right? And the effective corporate tax rate has fallen, importantly. Japan appears to have a high tax corp, uh, corporation, a corporate rate, a corporate tax rate, but as Tomioka Yukio showed uh, in his book, Zeki no Harawanu Kyodai Kigyo, many corporations have loopholes for tax avoidance, of course. Um, we've probably all read the news um, about the Panama documents and uh, tax avoidance, tax havens all over the world that, that giant corporations use so they don't have to pay any tax on their, on their money. So that most pay about 20% and some as low as 1%. The effective corporate tax rate in 2014 for Sumitomo Mitsui was 0.001%. That's how much tax they paid on their, on their income. SoftBank, it was 0.003%, and Uniqlo was 6.91%. So Japan has the least progressive tax burdens and benefits of any of the OECD nations. The benefits work in reverse flowing toward corporations and away from low earners. Obviously, I mean, this should be obvious to all of us if you've purchased anything in Japan, because the consumption tax is the only tax that has been rising. In 2014, it, it was raised from 5 to 8%, which is what we have now, and it's supposed to go up to 10%. By the way, this would completely, I mean, this is, this is like punishment for <laughs> average people, first of all, and even in, in positive evaluations of, of capitalist economics, there's no way that higher, corporate, uh, that higher consumption tax rates are going to be beneficial for anyone. They're not going to get people to buy more, and it's not going to promote any kind of growth. So, but again, as I've outlined in, neo, in the lecture on neoliberalism, it's not really about growth anyway. It's about an upward transfer of wealth. Um, during the years of uh, neoliberalism in Japan, the late 80s to the present, income taxes went down, corporate taxes went down, but consumption taxes went up. So this means, as I've said, that the tax burden falls unequally on poor and low earners, uh, 
And with less for public spending, Japan has then cut social welfare, education, health, and pension services. So this is the situation that we find ourselves in today. And this is why I like you know, Shin's article even probably better than um, Piketty's uh, approach, even though they build on his approach, is because they tie these um, political economic things to... Um, they, they, they tie politics to, to economics um, and, and also show that kind of social effects of these things as well. Um, Abi claims uh, success, however, um, and he generally likes to point to the booming stock market, for instance, much like Trump uh, and the media in the U.S. Uh, frequently do. But in Japan, the Bank of Japan and the Government Pension Investment Fund uh, buy up lots of domestic stocks. About 10% of domestic stocks are held by the Bank of Japan and the Government Pension Investment Fund. So this artificially boosts uh, corporate value uh, of uh, boosts corporation value and CEO salaries, while at the same time, citizens' pensions are being used to buy these stocks, essentially, of corporations. So citizens' pensions are being financialized and invested through stock market means in effect, the government is transferring people's unearned wages, that's what pension is, uh, unearned, and in this, in, in this meaning, unearned means um, to be earned in the future, have not been earned yet, uh, pensions to CEO pockets. And indeed, the assets of the 300 richest tripled in size in Japan, and during this period, the financial assets of the 40th richest doubled in size, and 1.8, there's been a 1.8 times rise in CEO pay of large corporations and a 1.7 times rise in growth of political donations to, ahem, um, the, the LDP. Who would have thought? In contrast, 31.2% of Japanese have no financial assets nor savings as of 2017. I'm going to show some graphs in a minute, but these show the um, public capital as a percent of national wealth, and this is very similar to uh, Piketty's research and how this is on decline around the world. So that um, Mizuhata writes at the end of her summary, the, uh, or her introduction, the primary effect of Abenomics has been to increase economic growth and corporate profits while the income of poor and working class people has fallen. That's it. In a nutshell, basically, that's this, the conclusion. So... Here they have mapped out using different uh, data acquired from the sources that, that they show. And, and this graph itself, um, I will uh, state, of course, is from Inoue Shin uh, in his article on, on Asia Pacific Journal Japan, Japan Focus. This is not my graph. Um, but he compare, they compare you know, uh, different uh, uh, countries here in different colors, Japan in pink, private capital, and public capital um, in comparison. And public capital, I mean, if you're looking here for the US and in the UK, for instance, now they're, they're below zero. There's no there's no public money for anything. To do anything, it's all private money. Most of, um, of the capital that exists in, in rich uh, countries. And here we can see the decline of public capital as a percent of national wealth um, more closely so that here we have China, for instance, dropping greatly. Um, and then everywhere else as well, public wealth is just going going down, right? So why is there no money for public services? Why is it, you know, um, why, why do public libraries and public pools and public gyms and all these public facilities, why do they not, they're basically non-existent or just completely you know, like in such dilapidated state that no one would want to use them. And why do private facilities always inevitably seem so much better? It's because of this huge transfer of wealth that's going on. Um, there, there is no public wealth to invest in those things. It's all just going to private corporations through tax breaks, um, deregulation, and all these things. We can also look at wages. And again, this is all from, you know, Ashin's article. This is not my data, not my graph. Um, he looks here in this, the red here, this is the Abe administration, and this is calculating the decline of uh, real wages taken out after, I'm assuming, expenses paid and taxes um, from this peak in 1996 to 1997, gradually um, 
declining quite dramatically. Um, so the people now earn less, of course, than their parents did, um, and certainly than, than baby boomer generations did. And I'll just to read a, a, a powerful quote that kind of captures the essence of these graphs from, you know, he says, as shown in the graph, real wages fell to their lowest levels from 2013 to 2016 during the Abe years. In short, while real wages were declining from 1996, Abenomics extended that decline in wages. In addition, when computing the actual wage for 2012, just before the advent of the Abe administration, we obtain an average salary of 4.8 million yen. The resulting graph depicts the decline in the average salary thereafter, 4.4 million yen in 2013, 3.93 million yen in 2014, 3.89 million yen in 2015, and 3.92 million yen in 2016. Compared with 2012, real annual wages fell by 40,000 yen. In 2013, by 150,000. In 2014, by 190,000. In 2015, and by 160,000 in 2016. This shows accumulated loss of 540,000 yen in wages during the past four years of the Abe administration. Uh, this is, of course, per person, right? Uh, meanwhile, retained earnings of corporations increased by nearly 28 trillion yen, which reached a record high of 406, of, uh, 406,000. Uh, well, I don't even know how to read that number. Um, what number is it? Okay. Um, of some odd trillions of yen, I guess. Uh, and similarly, their current profits have increased by 9.9% .9 um, to uh, 74.9 uh, billion yen. Another record high. Put simply, in 2016, workers' wages reached the lowest point since the launch of Abenomics, while retained earnings of large firms and recurrent profits rocketed to their highest levels. And then here he compares um, the information from the previous graph, the decline in wages, which is this bar, uh, or sorry, a line graph here, and then contrasts this with uh, the retained earnings of corporations uh, in trillions of yen, um, in blue before, and in red during the Abe administration. So it's just, they're inversely proportional to each other, essentially. Go figure, because workers create the value that companies derive their profits from. Okay, and then as I said, I wanted to look at um, the effects of some of these things on um, a particular social group in Japanese society. Again, I, I didn't get down to the micro level as much as I would want to, but um, just to point out one example of a great article that I like and I've um, highlighted elsewhere many times in the past, which looks at um, womenomics especially and um, a women's role in this, uh, in, in, um, in, in, and how you know social inequality has affected uh, women in Japan. And the article uh, that I, I draw from, uh, this little cursor thing goes away, is uh, Chelsea Scheider's uh, Womenomics versus Women, Neoliberal Co-optation of Feminism in Japan, published in the Meiji Journal of Political Science and Economics, Volume 3, 2014. So a little bit dated, but you know, coming out during the Abe administration, analyzing it quite early, actually, um, and looking at how these, these, these policies of womenomics actually affected women. And Prime Minister Abe advocated womenomics. He called for a society in which women shine. Jose ga kageyake du shakai. Or Jose ga kageyake du shakai, I guess, in 2013. But, as uh, Scheider points out, this is was just basically a rhetorical appropriation of feminism to advance neoliberal aims in the upward transfer of wealth at the expense of exploited labor. What really happened under womenomics is that the economic standing of a small group of elite women improved while the daily lives of average women remained the same or worsened. And this is key. Also, womenomics wanted to bring more women into the workplace to improve GDP i.e. strengthen the national economy rather than improve the lives of average women. So again, as I've mentioned, GDP not a very good indicator of um, how people actually experience the economy in their daily lives, right? Because um, 
if if giant corporations make tons of money off foreign investments or in the stock market, it doesn't or if they have a lot of assets they invest somewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to help average people. And then Scheider calls this kind of like a, a trickle-down feminism, which is you know, basically what Abenomics is, um, and then applied to women. Um, Abe boasted about his female cabinet members as one of the examples of womenomics that had succeeded, but in reality, the LDP has the lowest number of women, women dietitians, uh, just 10.5, whereas the highest percentage is in the JCP with 25.1. Neither of which are extremely high, by the way, um, but nevertheless, um, this the reality clearly does not match um, Abe's rhetoric here. Uh, this is trickle-down feminism, the idea that economic benefits for a few elite women will trickle down to average women, right? So he's got these few cabinet members, and hey, that's a great thing, and there, you know, I did it. He's a feminist, and that's all he needs to do, right? Something like that. But... She says that neoliberalism demands a new type of feminism, not this kind of um, symbolic, empty feminism, but one which focuses not just on getting women into wage work, where they have the dual burden of housework plus, plus wage work, but one which critiques the growing precarity and instability of the entire working class. And she cites Nancy Fraser, who says that insufficiently attuned to the rise of free market fundamentalism, Mainstream feminists have ended up supplying the rationale for a new mode of capital accumulation heavily dependent uh, of women's wage labor. And this is where Scheider basically is, is drawing the main thrust of her argument from, from Fraser's idea summed up nicely in this quote here. But then a great thing about Scheider's article is that she kind of um, looks at this in the broader history of modern uh, of modern Japanese history of, of, of women working in Japan. And she, she rightly points out that womenomics ignores the fact that the Japanese economy has long depended on women's cheap and or unpaid labor. For example, factory girls in the Meiji era. Not to mention housework, which is unpaid. And women do most of this, which results in a double burden. Even in the early post-war, she points out, that the high, there, during the high-growth periods, there was a reserve force of cheap labor from women's part-time work. And this is often overlooked, I think, but it's a, it's a key um, point to remember about this high-growth period in Japan. This division of homemaker, women, versus salary worker, men, reinforced stereotypical gender roles and drove down wages across the board. Because there's this, you know, basically uh, uh, unpaid reserve army of, of labor just working for free at home, right? And so, you know, this affects everybody. This affects men's wages as well. Um, so, today's, so today's womenomics policy is in fact just continuing this longer process. Note that most time workers today are women, as I pointed out uh, earlier, six out of 10 according to some figures, and then here she calculates in, in a different way. But in 2012, 12.47% uh, uh, 12 of, yeah, 12 of 18.13 million part-time workers were women. And this has resulted in the feminization of poverty, she says, where an increasing number of poor or working poor are women in Japan. So there we've looked at kind of a case study then of one social group in Japan affected by these large trends of social inequality that I've described going from the global level to the national level in Japan and then down to uh, a slightly more micro level. So in conclusion, just going to summarize these kind of basically three different um, pieces of research that I highlighted in this lecture. Piketty showed that global inequality is increasing dramatically. It follows a U-curve back to the Belle Epoque levels. He attributes this to low growth and high savings, the importance of returns on, and the importance of returns on capital. In short, with less new capital being created or produced, the importance of already existing capital and people who hold lots of it will grow disproportionately. And as many people have pointed out, by the way, this is not good for capitalism. N you know, not to mention, like, I mean, Piketty himself, like, 
he's basically you could you could interpret his arguments as arguing in favor of capitalism in a way because he's saying look this is not good this is unsustainable right we're going to get back to like i don't know feudalism or something here if this keeps continuing and then Inoue Shin and Sachi and Mizuhata loosely applied Piketty's approach to Japan, especially by calculating inequality as a function of capital share of national income. They convincingly showed a major transfer of wealth to the wealthiest in Japanese society versus the increasing impoverishment of the rest. Moreover, Inoue and Mizuhata attributed much of this to neoliberal reforms, such as gutting public services, eliminating full-time employment, and cutting corporate taxes. And they demonstrated some of the effects of this too, not least of which has been steadily falling wages. Chelsea Scheider looked more closely at these effects through her critical analysis of Abenomics and Womenomics. She determined the neoliberal co-option of feminism was a strategic ploy to increase the reserve force of cheap women's part-time labor, and which has had the effect of impoverishing average women. And that um, is the conclusion of my talk on social inequality uh, globally and in Japan. Um, I've, I hope you found some of the, the information and research I presented this, in this article to be stimulating. It um, can be a bit difficult uh, for me just as, um, you know, uh, uh, not an expert in, um, in the style of economics per se to explain uh, Piketty's, uh, some of Piketty's research, but um, the basic points are there, and they're 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 fairly, um, I think, easy to grasp, which is part of the reason why it was probably picked up so much. Um, and then, you know, as I pointed out, his inf his research has been very influential um, for some of the studies on social inequality in Japan as well. But as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, there's a lot more many more aspects that, that we could look um, or, or, you know, that we could look at and, and different angles that we could uh, take to analyze and investigate uh, issues of social inequality in Japan, how they affect different groups, um, different kinds of marginalized groups, but also average, any kind of average people, workers, uh, consumers, citizens, etc. Um, urban rural divide, for instance, uh, depopulation, the effects of all these things um, on education as well, so all kinds of things. And still also now living in our kind of constant COVID um, lockdown society with global wealth inequality being even further exacerbated, um, it, it seems very likely that, that Piketty's trends and his future predictions will certainly play out in, in that uh, direction. And I think it's important to investigate then um, historically the causes of some of these things and, and that will hopefully help us formulate better policies for how we can um, start to address and hopefully rectify, um, you know, growing inequality. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening.